Hey there. Welcome to this week's lockdown sermon. Are you finding it tough a few weeks in? As an extrovert, I have to say this whole talking to a camera lens thing is very depressing. I've been developing a personal pandemic mantra to help get me through, to help get me through the pandemic, not just the recording. It consists of five Christian practices in contrast with their alternatives. Uh, it goes like this, hope in place of fear, wisdom in place of foolishness, weeping in place of indifference, prayer in place of panic, love in place of selfishness. Hope, love and prayer as an expression of faith are cardinal Christian virtues and the pandemic is teaching us about weeping and lament. But one in my list of five seems to me an underrated virtue, and that's wisdom. Do you know the old proverb, early to bed and early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise? I know, I know, inclusive language. It's a very old proverb. Anyway, healthy, wealthy and wise. During the pandemic, which of those three have been receiving the most attention? We're very concerned about our health and the health of others, of course. We're very concerned about our wealth, that is, the economic impact of the pandemic at every level, and rightly so. It seems to me, however, that wisdom, the last of the three, has been shortchanged. Yet during a time of such upheaval and uncertainty, we really need wisdom. So here at All Saints Clayton, we've decided to turn to the preeminent place in the Bible for considering the theme of wisdom. And that's the book of Proverbs. We're going to spend a number of weeks learning from the book of Proverbs. First, from the opening chapters, which set a foundation for understanding wisdom from a biblical perspective. Then from the Proverbs themselves, as we explore some of the areas of life that this book helps us to navigate. The virtue of wisdom may not receive a lot of attention today, but that has not always been the case. The opening verse of the book of Proverbs tells us that we are about to read the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. That doesn't mean that Solomon coined every proverb in the book, but that this is a book of Solomonic wisdom associated with King Solomon, who lived almost a thousand years before Jesus and is the wise person par excellence in the Bible and the fountainhead of the wisdom collected in this book. Let me read you a prayer that Solomon prayed when he became king. It comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honour, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Healthy, wealthy and wise. Isn't it interesting? Solomon asked God to make him wise and God made him 
exceedingly wise and healthy and wealthy as well because God was so pleased that Solomon had asked for the most important of the three and set his heart on wisdom. Solomon was famous for his wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 4 tells us just how famous. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. And a few chapters later in 1 Kings 10, we read about what is perhaps the high point of Israel's life in the promised land. When the Queen of Sheba comes to visit King Solomon and is overwhelmed by his wisdom. After that, Solomon stops acting wisely and things go totally pear-shaped. But that's a story for another day. People travel across the world for adventure, for work, for economic opportunity, for love, for safety. Setting aside pandemic travel restrictions, would you cross the world for wisdom? You might ask, of course, what does the ancient wisdom of King Solomon have to offer me today? Well, if we are wondering who this wisdom is for, verses 4 and 5 tell us. For giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. So this is wisdom for beginners, the simple and the young. That is, there is wisdom here for those who lack it. And there is wisdom here for the wise and discerning. The people who are wise know the great value of wisdom and strive to become wiser. And for those who don't seek wisdom, the opening verses have a word to describe them too. We read in the last line of our passage that fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what exactly is this wisdom that you would be a fool to reject? Let's consider the dimensions of the wisdom described in the opening verses of Proverbs. Wisdom has an intellectual dimension for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight. Biblical wisdom requires you to think. If you want this wisdom, you'll have to be receptive to it and work for it. Wisdom also has a practical dimension for receiving instruction in prudent behavior. It isn't about that nerdy intelligence I'm thinking of the male characters on the Big Bang Theory, brilliant scientists with no idea how to do life and relationships. Wisdom is about skill for living well. Wisdom has a moral dimension too. Look at the second half of verse 3. Doing what is right and just and fair. It isn't just about doing what is shrewd, it's also about doing what is good. It's about head and hands and heart. As we'll see in a couple of weeks, it's about character, not just how you live, but who you are. And wisdom has a spiritual dimension. Verse seven tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Lord, doesn't refer to God in a general sense as the creator of the world, but to the God who has acted to save a people for himself, to live in relationship with him. The fear of the Lord doesn't mean being afraid of God. It means treating him with respect and awe, recognizing that he is God and we are not. To say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge means that treating God as God is the foundation on which you build a wise life, not the starting line you move away from. So the wisdom of the book of Proverbs has to do with living well under God and in relationship with God in God's world. Having said that, the book of Proverbs has a distinctive flavor because it looks through the lens of creation rather than salvation. 
It's a book about everyday life in God's world. The basic outlook of Proverbs is that God has created a world of order, and that order is just and understandable. That's an oversimplification, because the way life works is not always immediately evident or evidently just. See the books of Job and Ecclesiastes for details. But it captures the basic way Proverbs looks at the world. And if God has created a world of order, and that order is just and at least somewhat understandable, then wise people observe that order and live working with the grain of the universe rather than rubbing against it. So how does Proverbs fit with the big story of salvation that dominates the Bible's pages? Well, let me suggest four ways that the two great themes of creation and salvation relate to each other. First, the story of salvation begins with creation and ends with new creation. So living well under and with God in God's world is at one level the whole point of the story. So while the book of Proverbs departs from the Bible's main storyline of salvation history, it doesn't lead us off track. Perhaps a different analogy might help. One of my favourite childhood holidays was a houseboat trip on the Murray River. Uh, through the middle part of each day, we flowed along with the main current of the river. And then we would moor on the bank somewhere, and there'd be time to explore branches and backwaters and billabongs on foot or in a little rowboat. When did we experience the life of the river system? As we journeyed with the main current? As we explored the banks and backwaters? Well, both, of course, and they are integrally related. The flowing river provides life to the banks and backwaters. And we might say in non-scientific language that the river's very purpose is to give life. Second, God rules in both creation and salvation. The one who saves us is also the one who made us and sustains us. Third, God wants Jesus to have the first place in both creation and salvation. In the New Testament, Colossians chapter 1 describes Jesus as the firstborn over all creation and the firstborn from the dead, that is, first in creation and first in salvation. And the point of this is so that in everything he might have the supremacy, the first place, the highest honour. So the everyday wisdom of living well in the world is ultimately part of our Christian discipleship, part of giving Jesus the first place in everything. Fourth and last, at a personal level, we are creatures before we are Christians. I remember a story about two final year Bible college students. They were exemplary people and exemplary students until in their final year they began to treat others harshly and unkindly. The college couldn't work out what was happening and invited a senior Christian leader in to counsel these two young men. I think it was the famous evangelist D.L. Moody who was called in, but I may be misremembering. Anyway, the invited elder statesman interviewed the young men and discovered that they were so concerned about keeping up their grades that they were barely sleeping. What was his spiritual counsel for their ungodly behaviour? Get more sleep. We are creatures before we are Christians, and we need to respect that. It's part of being wise. So pray for wisdom, as Solomon did. That's a prayer God promises to answer. We read in James chapter 1, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And journey with us in the book of Proverbs over the weeks ahead as we seek God's wisdom for living in God's world. God bless you.